Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Now, you've no doubt noticed that the show has been off air uh, for a few months. Happily, we are back with you again, although we are not entirely free of technical issues. Now, if these emerge during the course of our time with our guests tonight, obviously we'll reschedule. Uh, but hopefully, with the internet God smiling on us, uh, it will be fine. But you never can tell, and I wanted to get that health warning in at the very beginning. Well, as you know, thanks to you, the TNT show and Indie Live are growing, but your support is always welcome. Uh, and you'll see, by the way, if you need to do any of the previous shows uh, on uh, YouTube anytime you like. Also, uh, if you're upset by media coverage of political events, uh, and economic matters uh, where you feel that journalism has been jumped in favour of stenography or rehashed news releases. If you're looking for an alternative voice, well, you found it. We're here for you. Uh, now is your chance to be here for us. Please support the crowdfunder. You'll find the details on the screen at some stage during the show. Tonight, this is extra special tonight. We're, we're talking to a real star guest. And we're absolutely delighted he's been able to find time to join us. Uh, we'll be talking to economist Richard Murphy. Now, among the subjects we're covering tonight, uh, please don't let this put you off because it's absolutely very interesting. And it's at the centre of what's happening in the UK just now. We'll be covering, amongst other things, the connections between ethics and economics. Now, I know many of you will be saying, uh, look, John, there are no connections. Well, I think you're completely wrong. And more importantly, I think our guest tonight will be able to show you how wrong you are and how important it is that these are conjoined. As well as his excellent guide uh, that ought to be in every home, uh, we'll be covering that too. It's called Money for Nothing uh, and My Tweets for Free. That's the other title. My money, money for Nothing and My Tweets for Free. Everybody should have a copy of this at home. They really ought. Uh, and it will enlighten you and empower you when you hear people who know nothing about economics telling you that they know everything about economics. Uh, and he'll be taking your questions live tonight. Uh, and there's still time to get your question considered. Uh, so feel free to find the details on the screen, by the way. Well, as you know, TNT stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license, no problem. Now, to our guest tonight, Richard Murphy. Thanks for joining us, Richard. How are you? I'm very well, and thanks for asking me, John. It's a great, great pleasure. Uh, we, we were talking earlier before we went on air about some of the very interesting things that are going on. And I talked about the connection between ethics and economics, but I know this is something that's very important to you. What, what do you see as the connection between ethics and economics that maybe doesn't right. exist just now? Economics is not based upon facts. If anybody thinks there are some immutable laws of economics that tell us how the world works, then you're looking in the wrong place to find such things. Economics is a faith system. It's no more or less a faith system than Christianity is or any other major world religion is. You take a set of assumptions about how you see the world and you build your worldview based on those. The assumptions that you make, the way that you see the world, the interpretation that you make of the world. And remember, every faith interprets the world through the lens of the person who believes in it. And I make that point very clear. Um, then economics is interpreted through that. So our ethics inform our economics in every single case where we discuss an, an economic issue. I recently put on Twitter that there are actually only two real choices in politics. And to a very large degree, I think that's true. And economics and politics, as far as I am concerned, are flip sides of the same coin. In fact, I call myself a political economist um, because that is the discipline which I was a professor of for several years at City University in London. And when you, you look at um, political economy, you have a choice. You either decide that your faith system is centered around the individual, Everything's about me, 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 or everything is based around society. Now, that doesn't mean to say we ignore the importance of the individual. Um, I actually will go back to a faith system to reference that. 
Um, you know, when Jesus was asked, um, what is the golden rule? Well, he said, it is love your neighbor as yourself. You know, that doesn't mean to say you love your neighbor more than yourself. It doesn't mean to say you love your neighbor less than yourself. You love your neighbor as much as yourself. So you've actually got to have some concern for you to be able to love someone else. But in my opinion, if we have a proper economics, if we have a proper politics, then we actually focus on the needs of society and how we coexist, co-create, care, um, have compassion for the world around us. And that's the basis on which we build it. Now, those are all ethical judgments. What is compassion? What is care? What is co-creation? which is what I would call work in very many real ways. I've never worked in isolation. I've been self-employed. I work, you know, sometimes on a project by myself, but always somewhere behind the scenes, there's a team, just as even you and I, John, have Kevin behind the scenes tonight as the producer. There's always our co-creator somewhere. So how do we care for those other people we work with, how those other people we meet and so on? This is all ethics. If you don't think ethics matters in economics, then basically you haven't understood what ethic, uh, economics is all about, you haven't understood what society is all about, and you're ill-equipped to answer any question it comes up with, in my opinion. Well, you, you articulate that very well. Uh, but as you say in your, uh, in your Money for Nothing uh, paper, this goes back a long way. I mean, you can write up back to Adam Smith, if you like, uh, and his oh. Wealth of Nations, which was preceded by uh, the theory of moral sentiments in which he categorically said what you just said. Absolutely. I mean, Adam Smith would have not known the term economist. It didn't exist. So he could not have used it to describe himself. He was a moral philosopher. And that's what he thought he was. And that's what he thought he was writing when he wrote the theory of moral sentiments, to which in all honesty, the wealth of nations, and there is actually a copy somewhere behind us, but it's possibly out of view to that side. Anyway, um, there is a copy behind us, and there's a copy of the theory of moral sentiment up there as well, um, because I've read both of them. And you know, it is all about the ethical choices he made. And we now live in a world where it is claimed that Adam Smith is the grandfather, great, great, great grandfather, probably, of everything to do with capitalism. And his name is used, for example, by the Institute of Economic Affairs based in London, whose director until very recently, Mark Little, when I knew well, because we appeared on so many BBC radio programs together. But yeah, that was just them claiming something that isn't true. Everything about Adam Smith's writing is about ethics, including the fact that he said, when three or four people from the same business join together, you can guarantee that within half an hour, they're working out how to conspire against the common good. Yeah, I sort of paraphrase what he said, but that's what he meant. And you know, so he understood that life is about choices and every choice is informed by our morality. It's interesting. Um, I have a personal insight into this because uh, at one point I formed the UK's first business ethics consultancy which we were pleased to call Integrity Works. And uh, it was obviously an aspiration, uh, this is more than an actuality. And I used to do uh, boardroom training, and uh, or integrity training as they call it. And one of the issues I used to, I, I used quotes from the Wealth of Nations, which I thought might appeal to the audience. And they were deeply gratified to hear a moral philosopher endorse their worldview. I would then put up a slide with some material from uh, the theory of moral sentiments. Uh, and they assumed that this was a completely raving uh, uh, <laughs> moralist who had no connection with the real world. And they were astonished very often when I told them, this is the same guy. Yeah. Same guy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the reason for doing that wasn't to sound smart or uh, supercilious. It was simply to say, look, you need to understand that uh, all of what you're thinking about today uh, that you think is clever business. This guy had a pretty good handle on what you were up to back then. <laughs> and his view was the following. And it was based on these ethical precepts. Uh, and it's a pretty good idea for you to take that on board, I would suggest. Uh, and I have to say, people did, in, in fairness to them, uh, say, yeah, there's some merit in this. Um, yeah, I mean, look, another chunk of the books behind me are um, sort of philosophy from pretty much Aristotle onwards behind there. Um, I'm not a great fan of Plato, so we'll skip him. Um, but 
<laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a whole, you know, and, and so the Nicadian ethics are up there too. And I think this is really important. And I keep on saying this to people, work that out before you try to do any of economics. I was asked only a couple of weeks ago by yeah, a lad, I will fairly call him a 16 year old, should he do economics um, A level, which of course is what happens in England where I am. And I said, no. Do politics, it's a much better subject to study at A-level. Because politics, A-level, which I happen to know the syllabus for, is all about choice. And economics, A-level, is all about doing some stupid graphs and pretending that everything can be reduced to a formula. Life can never be reduced to a formula. Um, it is not possible to do maths to explain the meaning of life. Um, unless, of course, the answer is 42, and we've all been there before now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, assuming the answer isn't 42, and if you don't understand that, by the way, just go and uh, Google the question. Um, but um, economics is obsessed with reducing everything to formulaic responses to questions. And there are no formulaic responses to questions that I'm aware of. I can do the maths by and large. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a bad mathematician. I'm a brilliant mathematician, but then most economists aren't brilliant mathematicians. They're competent at best. But that isn't the way to look at the world. And I long ago moved from any thought of being economist to being political economist, because I think that's much more important. And to be clear, what political co economy does is it looks at the power relationships within society and asks how power influences the outcomes that we see all around us. Perfect example of this at the time we're recording in the UK as a whole, the post office sub postmaster dispute. The people with the power decided that they were not gonna prejudice their own positions and therefore compromise the well-being of the sub postmasters who did not possess power in their relationship. The consequence is the most massive miscarriage of justice. This yeah. was ethics gone wrong. I mean, it's interesting too that it, it I mean, I've written a couple of books on business ethics uh, for my sins. Uh, and, and one of the pieces of research that we use frequently in these books was uh, the, the, the classic that we got from one of our clients, was it, which is, I'm not sure if it's accurate, by the way, um, uh, but Anita Roddick said, a fish rots from the head down. Uh, oh, it is one of her regular quotes. I, well, I, I mean, I, obviously, since she's no longer with us, I did meet her. Um, when I was running a firm of accountants um, and I was meeting new clients regularly, and they'd come in and they'd tell me what they wanted to do, there was one type of client who I never wanted to deal with. And in fact, I always declined to deal with. I'd ask them, what are your motivations for doing this? Whatever it was they were describing that they were going to do. And if they said it was making profit, I said, that's great. You need to go to somebody else. And they'd look at me completely astonished. Why? Aren't you interested in making profit? I said, yeah, of course I am. I make profit. I live off the profits of this firm. And I have run firms, you know, other in, uh, activities for other people, partly for myself and have made profit, and I'm not apologizing for that, although I'm a clearly left of center economist. Um, I believe in the mixed economy, I think that works. But I always said to the people, if your motivation is profit, you've misunderstood the fact that a successful business that makes profit does so by meeting the need of its customer, its employee, the society in which it lives, the environment and everything else. Oh, and by the way, if your goal is making profit, almost invariably, you'll argue about my fee and pay it late. And I'm not interested in therefore providing you with a service. So look at it whichever way you like. You're not my client. Bye. <laughs> and I literally was always willing to do that. We chucked out 50 percent of all the people who came to ask us to work for them on the basis we didn't like their ethics. It was fine. And it worked. We had a really successful practice, which made a lot of money because we wouldn't deal with people who we didn't agree with. I, I had the same experience in the, when we were in the, uh, running the ethics company. Uh, is that, uh, at, at that I'd written a couple of books on business ethics, as I said, and it became sexy all of a sudden. And uh, dare I say it, Shell and uh, the Body Shop were both our clients. So it's, were both clients at the same time. In fact, I remember I used to have to walk under bar uh, banners held by Anita Roddick outside the Shell head office, and uh, which she was holding up a great sign saying "Shell are murderers," <laughs> and I had to duck underneath this damn sign every time. And she would shout after me, "Give them hell, John!" 
but I was more of a believer in uh, that every uh, every sinner has a past, and every uh, every uh, saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. Um, and uh, and we tried our best, and things did change for a while. I suspect. Uh, no, I'm not sure how permanent that uh, change necessarily is, but it seems to me that's. The, the reason that your work is so useful, it seems to me, and helpful, uh, particularly now, is that, that people need constantly re- reminded that, that that morals and ethics are important because when they, they, they're surrounded by a sea of cynicism. Um, Look, I think this is really important. I And it's what worries me about politics. You know, I always find it odd that I've become... A character in Scottish politics, um, because I'm not Scottish. Um, I have two passports. One is British. One is Irish. Um, my name is very clearly Irish. My grandfather is where I get the passport from. Um, I've never lived in Scotland, although I have a great love for Scotland and Scottish people, and I believe in its independence as much as I would if. Ireland was no you know, not independent in the way it now is. I would believe it being independent now as well. well so, what reasons would you actually give for for suggesting that? Why why do you think Scotland ought to be independent? Oh, uh, look, Scotland is a nation. It is identifiable as a nation. It has a history. It has a culture. It has its own narrative. It has its own law, which represents the way in which it believes it should be governed. It has its own education, which reflects its values and, again, its culture, its thinking, its people. I believe that it is economically viable. I believe the people of Scotland see the world in a different way from the way that the people of England, Wales and Northern Ireland and Ireland see the world and other countries see the world. I see it as a nation state. Bluntly, that is why I think Scotland should be independent, because it is, as far as I can see, and I've visited a lot of nations in the course of my work, as independent a state as Denmark is, as Slovakia is, as Germany is, as France is, as the England is. And they, you know, there is no reason for Scotland to now be ruled from Westminster. The Scottish well, you, say, you say that, Richard, but uh, some of the people watching tonight will be familiar with GERS, G-E-R-S, and they'll yes. be saying, oh, this is complete nonsense from Richard. We've read GERS, and it's quite categoric. It would be a foolishness of the greatest order to be independent. What do you think of GERS? Well, I've written about GERS, and in fact, GERS is one of the reasons why I became in, involved in Scottish political debate. Because when I first read and looked at GERS, it, it struck me that at an academic accounting and economic level, JERS is what I was the first thing I ever called CRAP. Now, CRAP in this sense is not a term of abuse as such. It's an acronym. It stands for Completely Rubbish Approximations. And JERS is a completely rubbish approximation to the truth about what happens in the Scottish economy. It is an accounting falsehood because it recognises income on one basis, which is narrow, i.e. government income within Scotland, and it recognises expenditure on a wider basis, i.e. expenditure for Scotland, not all of which by any means will be spent within Scotland. It doesn't credit Scotland with the tax paid on that expenditure for Scotland paid in England, nor does JERS take into account, because there is no way it can, because there is no data to do this, the flow of imports and exports in and out of Scotland, and in particular the financial flows out of Scotland, because I think that the financial flows out of Scotland, which result in non-payment of taxation in Scotland, and JERS, remember, is largely an account of taxation income and government expenditure. It is not a national account of GDP or anything like that. Um, there is no way that um, JERS correctly captures, for example, the flow of interest and rents out of Scotland, as well as profits, to London, where the vast majority of those incomes, rents and profits will be recorded because that's where most of the corporate headquarters of the UK are. Now, it is claimed by the statisticians that they make adjustment for this. I don't believe that's true. Um, I think that there are enormous um, risks to relying on JERS. I don't believe that if you look at JERS and equivalent statements, they're not quite equivalent, but they're broadly similar, for Wales and if we take the north of England and we think that, oh, 
you know, the UK deficit is apparently one third explained by the 8% of the population of the country in Scotland. No, that's not possible. It's just ludicrous to say that everybody in Scotland is so slothful, so bad, so subsidised, so horribly inefficient. It is just bad accounting. It is not realistic. Don't rely on it. Um, and in fairness, the statistics say, do not presume that this will reflect the um, economics of an independent Scotland. Well, I suppose that's the only th good thing that is said in jurors. Don't rely on this to be an indication of what will happen in independent Scotland, because it will be nothing like that. It's just total and utter nonsense. Start again. Um, I really, really do wonder why. Um, the SNP still allows jurors to be published. Yeah, it was clearly a Tory contract when it was first created in 1992. It was improved in the early part of this century by the Ewings. They did some good work trying to improve it, but it remains deeply deficient. I've given evidence on that at Holyrood before now. Um, I will never be persuaded in its current form that it provides any meaningful information that anyone in Scotland should rely upon. Um, just start again and Scotland should be collecting the data to actually properly appraise this. It still has not got a sufficiently good statistical service to capture that data and organisations like Common Wheel, of which I'm a bit of a fan, have long argued that this is required and it still isn't there. So Scotland needs to actually get itself ready for independence by capturing the data that it needs to manage yeah. its economy in the future. I mean, it, it, uh, I too am fascinated by the fact that the the Scottish government continues to publish material which is such evidently flawed. I mean, what is the point of that? One asked. Leaving aside that it's jazz, why would any government want to publish material that's flawed? I mean, it doesn't strike me as commonsensical. Why do you think um, they do that? Well, I, I mean, let, let me be clear. I'm not a member of the SNP. I'm not a member of any political party anywhere. Um, and I will criticise the SNP when it's appropriate. So, you know, let me stand back. If you're upset by me saying that there are some things about the SNP I simply don't understand, you'll just have to live with it. Because I'll say that of every political party. There's some things I don't understand about every party I look at. And there are occasions when I wonder whether the SNP is completely committed to independence. Um, I mean, clearly vast numbers of people in the SNP are. But there are occasions, and I'm not the only person to have noticed this, when it does appear that some of the SNP leadership are remarkably comfortable with the current situation in Scotland, where they have nice ministerial titles, good salaries, they have status, um, they have some power without ultimate authority because they can always pass the buck to Westminster at the end of the day. It's not uncomfortable a place to be. And candidly, right now, even given the problems that the SNP has run into, the likelihood that there will be continuing government by the SNP in Holyrood is high. Um, may not be as comfortable as it has been. It may be back to the days when power sharing was necessary in various different ways beyond the current voluntary arrangement with the Greens. But I do wonder whether life for the SNP has become a bit comfortable and therefore they continue with structures which are insufficiently challenging. One of the preconditions of change is that you're willing to look at what currently exists and say it's not good enough. Are those who've got their nose to the grindstones running ministries in Scotland really able to stand back sufficiently and simultaneously say this situation is not good enough? because they're too familiar with what the day-to-day -day is to fully understand that the day-to-day -day of devolved government isn't what the goal is for Scotland. Because the devolution settlement is another thing that's crap. It's a completely rubbish approximation to what's needed. Um, it's terrible on tax. It's terrible on some of the devolved powers. It does not let Holyrood really govern Scotland. And that is something that the SNP should be saying a lot more. And it, it frustrates me enormously that they don't. I just don't get it. I don't understand it. I wish I did. Well, is it, I hope somebody's going to answer. Yes, on that point, what sort of uh, response, stroke reaction did you get when you, um, I think, because I think you said you, you'd spoken at Holyrood committees. Have I got that right? Did you speak? Yeah. yeah. What sort of reaction did you get? Well, look, there was a period of time when I seemed to be pretty popular with um, the SNP. 
Um, and I was regularly invited to Holyrood. I was regularly invited to talk to the Westminster group of SNP MPs. It's a long time since that happened. There seems to have been a big change of mood. Now, that may have been because some people in the SNP thought, as some people in Labour did, that I was behind Jeremy Corbyn's ideas. Can I be clear? I know Jeremy Corbyn. I know John McDonald. I have done for a long time. Um, but they nicked my ideas to use in Jeremy's campaign to become leader of the Labour Party. They didn't ask me, first of all. I don't mind. I write ideas. People are very welcome to borrow them. And Jeremy was quite welcome to do so. The borrowing was actually done by his um, policy guru, Andrew Fisher. Um, who I'd known for some time. He wrote Jeremy's economic policy based very heavily on work that I'd done. And I think some people then thought I was associated too closely with Labour. I wasn't a member of the Labour Party. I didn't even pay three quid so I could vote for Jeremy Corbyn to be leader of the party, which was an option that was available to me. I'm that mean or I'm that independent, whichever way you look at it. But the point I'm making is that I think that I did to some extent, then move out of the SNP circuit because they thought I was too close to the Corbyn circuit. In fact, I decided in the end that Corbyn had failed us on Brexit because I think he did so deliberately, by the way. I did so on the basis of inside information I had on his attitude to how to run that campaign, which he basically decided to sit out. I was told that from very high up in the party, and I disapproved of that. Um, and so and we, we all know the consequence of that. And I was disappointed. And I made that very clear. So anyway, Jeremy Corbyn's team never spoke to me again after 2016 either. But I certainly am not as close to the SNP as I was. I don't know nearly as many people now as I did. Um, do I really care about that? No, not particularly. Uh, a very wise man, when I was really quite a wee fella, um, I'm talking about 13 or 14, told me that um, if I really wanted to change the world, and apparently I had obviously um, indicated that it was my ambitious even back then, um, told me that if I wanted to change the world, I should be a poet. If I couldn't be a poet, be a novelist. If I couldn't be a novelist, be a philosopher. If I couldn't be a philosopher, be an economist. But bottom of the pile was a politician, because as he put it, they just nick other people's ideas. So my job is to throw out ideas. And if somebody wants to borrow them, that's great. If they want to ignore them, I've tried. I'll try again next week and do something different. In fact, I'll probably try again tomorrow morning because I write 3.3 blogs a day on average. Normally before breakfast, it's a very sad thing to wake up in the morning and think I'm going to write three blogs before I have my Weetabix, but that's what I do. It's 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 interesting that the, uh, as you put it, the SAP has sort of gone off uh, the idea because it seems to me many of your thoughts are exceptionally helpful to a cause. I mean, I'm not a member of any political party either. I just, I just thought when I look at the situation and I look at the the state the UK is in, uh, and what troubles me most, I suppose, is what I've described in my column as a moral collapse. Uh, in other words, it, it wasn't so much that Boris Johnson abused the system. He just happened to recognise that the system is capable of abuse. Yes. Because there is no written constitution, there is nothing in the, at the end of the day that constrains politicians, apart from some sense of uh, personal morals. Um, because if Parliament is sovereign, as it is, uh, and the government has a working majority, then it effectively writes the constitution day by day and decides who should be imprisoned and who should not be in use, what's acceptable and what's not. Um, now, that may change after the next election, but I suspect not when I look at the pronouncements that are made. Do you get a sense that, uh, that Keith Starmer is somebody who is out to uh, uh, radically change the system and take on board some of the thoughts that you've had on ec economics and ethics? Well, I will tell you that at one time I was a not infrequent visitor to Rachel Reeve's office. I could locate it without instruction inside Port Cullis House at Westminster, which is where most of the MPs have their um, offices. I haven't been there for some time. I've never met Keir Starmer. Um, I haven't been invited to. Um, I still know 
a number of Labour MPs, as the same, by the way, as I know Lib Dems, as I know mm. SNP, as I know um, One Play Um and I know yeah, people from other parties as well. Yeah, George Osborne once asked me to work on a Treasury committee um, in 2013, and I did. Um, in all fairness, I've even done some stuff for the Tories in my time because it was the right thing to do. Um, Keir Starmer, look, I hoped that he was going to be the right social democrat to lead the Labour Party, I hoped. Um, I wasn't hoping for a socialist because I didn't think the country wanted a socialist. I did think it wanted a thoroughly good social democrat, somebody who had a moral conviction to understand how we can manage this mixed economy where we find the right balance between the role of the state, the role of the private sector, each does what they are meant to do best, cooperates and provides as a consequence, the best for the people of the country. That's what I hoped. He abandoned every principle that he said he had when he came into office. Every single one of his 10 commitments seems to have been abandoned. Um, I can't work out what it's about. What I do know is that Rachel Reeves, I mean, I genuinely do not understand Keir Starmer. I don't think he's got a moral compass, as bluntly as that. And I wrote in the national newspaper a week ago, you know, frankly, if you're voting for Keir Starmer, you're voting for a megalomaniac who doesn't want, know why he wants power, but he's desperate to get his hands on it, which is a kind of strong statement, which kept my editor pretty happy, I think it's fair to say. Um, you know, and keeping editors happy is quite important in life. Hello, Laura, just in case you're watching tonight. Um, so, you know, that's what I try to do. But it seemed popular with the readers as well. But the point I'm making is I genuinely think that when we started talking about ethics, I don't know where Keir Starmer's are. What I do know is that he is incredibly close to Rachel Reeves, and Rachel Reeves is a former Bank of England employee who went to Oxford and did an Oxford economics degree. Um, Oxford economic degrees seem to be, um, I mean, it's politics, philosophy, and economics. Well, God knows, half of them don't see him. They get a PPE degree. Actually, they can't do the math, so they don't do the economics bit. They do the politics and the philosophy, quite a lot of them. Um, I don't think she did the philosophy bit. Certainly, she didn't discover ethics, as far as I can see. As she did work for the Bank of England. She's become, if you like, a Bank of England stroke treasury automaton who does believe the world runs by formulas. She's very happy with the way that Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, is running the country at present, which is, frankly, driving millions of households into destitution, leaving people in despair, um, heading us for recession and treating inflation as if we actually needed to treat it when in fact it would always go away as my mate Danny Blanchflower who was once on the monetary policy committee and I always said it would we weren't alone but we were pretty noisy in the UK about saying that when not many people were um, and she instead believes that uh, Andrew Bailey should have the power to ruin the economy if that's what he wishes the consequence of that belief that basically the economists and their formulas should work on a neoliberal basis, which is what she very clearly is, is that she is the underpinning of the Labour Party, as far as I can see it at present, aided and abetted by Wes Streeting, whose sole aim in life seems to be to privatise the NHS. Um, silly boy Streeting, as he is called by a very good NHS commentator, Roy Lilly, um, which I think is rather appropriate because I think silly boy really does fit him quite well. You can see I'm really aspiring to get a job and advising the shadow team here, let alone Labour. Um, and, yeah, because I'm so out of sync with them. Um, and... Um, I mean, it scares me, Richard. Um, they are what I now call the TCP. Um, you, know, you probably know TCP is that ghastly disinfectant smell that yes. seemed to invade every school when I was a kid and still pretty much does as far as I can work out. God knows why. But TCP actually stands for Tory Continuity Party. Um, yeah. And so Labour is now Lino, Labour in name only, and the TCP, the Tory Continuity Party. Those are what I now call it, because as far as I can see, it's not Labour and it's not anything but trying to actually provide a sort of David Cameron style approach to austerity circa 2011 with Rachel Reeves playing the role of George Osborne. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, the, Before we go on to the radio interview that we said we would cover, uh, if oh, we have time. I forgot later. about that. <laughs> yeah, the um, uh, what did you think of the paper that was produced a couple of three years ago by the SNP government that said that the transition to independence will take this form? It was authored by Andrew Wilson. What, what was your evaluation of that? Oh, Andrew Wilson and Charlotte Street Partners. Uh, what a wonderful setup they are. Look, Andrew Wilson just got 
you know, he's a pure neoliberal um, pro-business um, economist who believes, as does Keir Starmer, I mean, there's remarkable similarities, you know, growth is the answer to everything. In a finite world, growth is not the answer to everything. Um, as I used to say to students, and I was lecturing in London at the time, and if I'd been lecturing in Glasgow, by the way, this would have been a different joke. I used to say when lecturing in London, the answer to every economist's question is Middlesbrough or Newcastle, because that line that goes up to the northeast on a graph indicates where your destination should be. Now, if I was in Glasgow, I'd be saying the destination is probably Inverness. You know, head for the northeast or Aberdeen, um, because that's apparently what every economist wants. The answer is in the northeast because it's bigger and better up that graph. Well, actually, that graph indicates something that is not possible. We live in a finite world. That's why I'm also very green and you know, a co-creator of the Green New Deal, which is still supposedly part of Labour's agenda. That 28 billion that they're in trouble with with the Tories is all about delivering the Green New Deal. And I was one of the original eight people who co-wrote the Green New Deal in 2008. So I accept blame for that and delighted that was one of the ideas that they still seem to be hanging on to, even if they won't talk about it. But fundamentally, if we go back to Andrew Wilson and Charlotte Street Partners and the Growth Commission in Scotland, his idea was that Scotland was too wee, too stupid, too small, too whatever, too poor to actually really stand on its own two feet. So we ended up with this absurd idea that Scotland could be independent and use the sterling as a currency which would have guaranteed um, austerity, um, that Scotland had to spend its time collecting foreign currency until it had sufficient reserves to have its own currency, when in fact a currency swap on day one from a Scottish new Scottish pound to an old English pound would have actually created all the reserves that were required. Just read what the Scottish Currency Group has written on this stuff. Please just go and look at there. I'm in, an advisor to the Scottish Currency Group, but you know those people there are doing good work. Um, uh, it was a complete misunderstanding from a deeply microeconomic perspective of how the world works in Scotland. Let me be clear about this. Microeconomics is the discipline that is supposedly looking at how we as individuals or companies work. It assumes that we only have one interest in life, which is maximizing our utility. Now, I don't know how many people who are watching tonight, I don't know whether you've ever done this, John, have you ever counted up your utility and how much of it you've got and you haven't? No, that's because there isn't any such thing as utility. It doesn't exist. It's complete fiction. It's nonsense. You know, technical term, bullshit. Sorry if you don't like it, but that's exactly what utility is. We don't have utility. It's made up to try and create a universal measure. It assumes some absurd things like we will know everything about the future. Again, as I used to lecture to students, um, the assumptions of microeconomics, if they're to work to prove that markets are really the great savior that they are, require that you know from now to eternity what you're going to do. If you don't know on the 21st of May 2037 that you are going into a branch of Pizza Express and ordering a Fiorentina, then the whole of the future of the world's economy collapses because egg demand from now to eternity is dependent upon the fact you order a Fiorentina and not a margarita because that's one extra egg on the 21st of May 2037, which has to be taken into consideration in calculations at this point in time. It's just so bizarre. But they build macroeconomics as if we have this microeconomic system. And even more bizarrely, the macroeconomics that the likes of Andrew Wilson used has one fundamental variable missing from every equation. And that thing that is missing is money. There is no money in their macroeconomics. They assume that everybody barters. There isn't a money equation in macroeconomics at all. It's that crazy. They built a whole theory about the future currency of Scotland based upon a model which didn't have money in it. I mean, these people really, really are quite. Well, stupid, to be blunt. We have to stand back and build models based upon reality rather than these fictions. And that's what Andrew Wilson did. He bought the textbook, he read it, absorbed it, and then regurgitated it in a report which was always going to condemn Scotland to austerity. Thank God it's over and gone with it. I, you know, when Scotland looks at independence again, seriously, and I hope it does, and I hope I'm around to witness it, and I will have a word to say about it when it happens, we don't get faced with something like that. Cool. Excellent. 
Uh, let's let's move on, if we can, to the uh, the radio interview that never took place, but you wished it had done. And if you can play the part, please, of a political economist rather than a politician, and, and I'll ask if if I made a dumb question, uh, <laughs> which will take us through. Um, here's a question number one. We may not get a chance, Richard, by the way, to go through all of these tonight, but let me ask you the question. Uh, interviewer, let's face reality here, Richard. The country is more than two trillion pounds in debt, and this has got to be repaid. What would you do about that? I would increase the amount of debt. Straightforward, simple, honest answer. But first of all, I would actually account for the national debt as it actually is. And I did a blog published on the 23rd December on my blog, Funding the Future. Um, the URL is taxresearch.org.uk still, by the way. Sorry about that. We've never changed the URL. Cool Funding the Future. On the 23rd December, I did an explanation of why the UK has not got national debt of 2.6 or 2.7 trillion, as the government claims. The actual figure is about 1.6 trillion. Exactly 1 trillion of the UK government debt doesn't exist. Over 700 uh, billion of that is because the debt is already owned by the government. Now, I tell you, repaying a debt that you already owe to yourself is really easy because you've already repaid it. So why on earth are these idiots claiming that we owe 700 billion quid when they've already bought it back? Um, that's what quantitative easing did. And there's 300 billion, which is a made up fabrication accounting number, which is complete nut. I'm going to use that word again. Bullshit created by the Office for National Statistics, who won't like me saying it. But they claim it's debt owed by the Bank of England. Now, I'm a competent chartered accountant. If you go and read the accounts of the Bank of England, there is no debt owing to anybody of 300 billion, which they include in their accounts because it doesn't exist. It is simply wrong. So first of all, the debt is 1.6 trillion, not 2 plus 6 trillion. Secondly, it's not debt. It's actually money deposited by people who want to save with the UK government. Let's be very clear about this. The government doesn't borrow money. It doesn't need to borrow money because money is created by the UK government. Why do you borrow money which you've already made? No, what people want to do is put their money in a very safe place where it won't get lost. So what do they do? They save it in UK government bonds. UK government bonds are literally the only investment apart from saving with national savings and investments, which is the government of the UK's savings bank, which is guaranteed to always repay in the UK. Your money in Barclays, your money in RBS, your NatWest, as it now wants to call itself, your money in Lloyd's, your money in a building society, none of those are guaranteed to repay, which is why the government actually has to put an 85,000 quid guarantee on the deposit you place with them, because they can't afford to give that. But the UK government cannot go bust because it can always print some more money to repay its debts. So people who know that, like very large companies, pension funds, life assurance companies, overseas major governments, all want to save with the UK government. But they don't lend the UK government money. They save money with the UK government. And that's exactly the same when you put money in a bank. When you put money in a bank, you think I've got money in the bank. Actually, all you've got is money owed back to you by the bank. And you are lending money to the bank and they borrowed from you. Exactly the same, the UK government, it borrows your money because it's on deposit. There is no debt. And if we repaid that debt, let's just imagine we repaid all that debt. There'd be no money left in the UK because the so-called national debt is actually the UK money supply. In fact, 85 billion quid of the UK national debt is notes and coins. So there wouldn't be any notes and coins left. No, there wouldn't be any Scottish notes and coins either because they have to be backed up exactly pound for pound by English notes and coins. So there would be nothing left that we could spend. Is that what you want? I ask people who want to repay the national debt. I did the Edinburgh Festival once. This is a long answer to your question, John. We're never going to get through all your questions. Did the Edinburgh Festival once just after I published my book, The Joy of Tax. And I made this point to the audience and there were about 350 people listening to me. And I said, look, if you really don't like your share of the national debt, it looks like this. And I held up a 20 quid note. I said, I know you've already paid a tenner to come and hear me. But if you want to leave your share of the national debt at the door when you go out, I'm more than willing to take it off your hands. Do you know, not a single tight bastard left me a single penny. <laughs> well, that's, that's a reflection of Edinburgh office. Uh, 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 
here's the next question. And, and we're assuming the interviewer has completely misunderstood what you've just said. But you know, everyone knows that we cannot afford this debt. The Chancellor is already warning that if interest costs go up by 1%, then the cost of government debt will increase by 25 billion. How can you not worry about that? Look, first of all, let's be clear again, that number about the cost of UK government debt is another of those crap numbers. Completely rubbish approximation to the truth. There are several reasons why. I've just told you that over 700 billion of the debt is owned by the Bank of England. They actually pay interest on that 700 billion. Now, there is a sort of debt that replaced the government bonds that were bought back by the government. And the money that replaced it, sort of, and this is very complicated, so I'm, we're never going to be able to run through it tonight, but there's lots of stuff about this on my blog at the moment, literally running right now. The thing that replaced it was something called the central bank reserve accounts. And the government created a lot of money which they spent into the economy during the 2008 financial crisis and during COVID, you know, paying for things like furlough. It was simply money. That was all it was, money that they paid into the economy. But they had to get it into the real economy, and they did that by giving it to the banks to spend to the people who, to whom the money was owed. If you got furlough, it was paid through your bank, and the government gave the bank the money before it gave it to you. They still owe, technically, that money to those banks, and they're paying interest on it. Now, just imagine this. Somebody comes along to you and says, would you take a billion quid off my hands? And by the way, I'll pay you five and a quarter percent to take it off my hands. What would you do? Would you say, yeah, I think I'll do that? Yeah, well, that's what the banks did. They said, thank you very much. I'll take that money off your hands. This year, they're going to make over £40 billion out of the interest that the government's going to pay them because they took this money off the government's hands. Now, that's ludicrous. £40 billion is half of the education budget. It's bigger than the defence budget. It's that daft. And yet we're paying the banks that. So first of all, we don't need to pay that. We could cut that figure dramatically by, first of all, either cutting the interest rate or simply saying, we're not going to pay interest on most of this money. We'll only pay on a small part of it. And now I'm involved in technical discussions on how to do that. I could probably cut 30 billion off the cost like that overnight. Yeah, I could save you 30 billion quid. I, I'd even take a percentage to tell them how to do it. Um, a small percentage would still keep me comfortable for the rest of life. Then let's also talk about the other large part of that interest payment. It's on something called index linked bonds. Bonds. Index linked bonds pay almost no interest, but they do have the amount of money that will be repaid when they come to the end of their term increase in line with inflation. Most index linked bonds have a life of at least 15 years. So right now, a bond that was issued for 100 quid, but in the last year, let's presume there was 10 percent inflation, will have gone up by 10 quid in value. But that 10 quid won't be paid until 2039. OK, the government says the entire 10 quid that's gone up in cost has to be added to interest charges now. But it wasn't an interest charge because it was an interest in the cost of repaying the bond at the end of the day. And under good accounting rules, in my opinion, you'd spread that 10 quid over the next 15 years. So to claim that the interest charge is as high as the government claims it is, is yet another of these bullshit figures created by economists to try and make us worried about the fact that our economy is tanking and that we can't afford to have things like decent homes, decent education, decent benefits, decent pensions and everything else that's decent in life. It's there to crush the ordinary people of the country, but keeps the bankers happy. So interest is not a problem. We haven't got an interest burden that we need to worry about. Why do you think in that case that we have politicians on consistently on television and radio are telling us that the national debt is a crisis situation and something has to be done about it. Because almost every politician in England, at least, went to Oxford and did a politics, philosophy and economics degree. I blame a hell of a lot on that degree. Um, I'm sure um, it doesn't increase, improve my popularity in Oxford. I actually got banned from Oxford at one time uh, for asking awkward questions at a conference. Um, I wasn't an academic at that time, so they can do it. They can't anymore. But that degree teaches that pure microeconomic theory, let's go back to this nonsense where it's all about me, 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 is the priority in neoclassical economics, as they call it. And society doesn't matter. 
government is an aberration in their economics. They're taught that. Government is a disruption of the need for the market to be supreme, to allocate resources efficiently within society. That's what every single, it appears now, Labour and, polit and Conservative politician believes. The market will always answer your question. So, you know, that's why we're streeting, silly boy streeting is saying, let's bring the market in to solve the problems in the NHS. Um, thankfully, Scotland has its own NHS and its own health minister. So you, know, you can keep West Streeting at bay, but you can't keep Rachel Reeds at bay. And they believe this stuff and they believe it's their job to keep government at bay. So all of them think that basically the smaller the government, the better the efficiency of the economy, the greater the chance of there being growth. And therefore, I've got another cup of tea arrived right mid flow, but I need one. Thank you very much. And therefore, they believe that their job is to literally constrain the size of government. And this story about too much debt and too much interest helps them do that therefore they buy it absolute let's go right back to the beginning john you talked about ethics this is an absence of ethics they're using made-up stories to achieve a goal which is against the best in uh, interests of the people of scotland england wales and northern ireland it does seem to be a general thing i mean it's almost universal I mean, if you look at the states i don't see too much of a difference in the political rhetoric there well, you don't accept. Just look at what Biden has actually done. Um, the IRA, um, his Inflation Response Act or whatever it's called. I can never remember what the IRA stands for. I know the first one is inflation. Yeah, it's always a slightly unfortunate choice of initials, isn't it? That, um, uh, the states is really good at choosing IRAs for this because their pension funds are also called IRAs. Okay. Um, and I'm old enough to remember when those weren't terribly popular um, initials. Um, but look. That actually is all about government spending to stimulate the economy and to tackle climate change. Biden has been much more um, proactive um, in his economic policy than anybody expected. I'm not saying I'm a great fan of everything that Biden's done. Please don't, you know, suddenly accuse me of supporting him on things like Gaza because I don't and foreign policy because I don't and justice because I don't. But actually, in terms of their economics, the Democrats have proved to be a rather more radical than we expected. But that said, the US Fed and the narrative around the forthcoming presidential election will be dominated by discussion on debt. And when you look at the Republican Party, I mean, let's be blunt, they just hate government. They'll do everything they can to close down government. And they've been incredibly successful at it. Their most successful policy was to actually deny funding to um, another um, IR, but this time the IRS, the Inter Internal Revenue Service in the USA, which is their tax authority, they basically decided the best way to kill government was to deny it the chance to collect money from the wealthy. And so they underfunded the IRS. And of course, who were the wealthiest people? The Republican supporters who were giving it large sums of money. And so, hey, we'll, look, we'll talk about that. Pure neoclassical economics in play. I've given some money to the Republicans and they've cut my tax bill. Amazing. I mean, it, it, it is fascinating to me, you know, uh, let me just tackle one last question, if I may. This is the interviewer saying to you, to you, you can say all that, Richard, but the Treasury, the Bank of England and the Office for Budget Responsibility all disagree with you. So why are you right and they are wrong? <laughs> well, because I've got the evidence on my side and I've consistently been right. Um, I mean, let's be clear about that. For example, when it came to inflation, I said that inflation will by now be falling heavily and you didn't need to have a change to interest rates to achieve that. And if you did put up interest rates, then um, it would take two years to have an impact. And in fact, inflation has fallen um, much faster than the two year time scale that um, since we've put up in interest rates. So interest rates have had nothing to do with the fact that um, these figures have fallen. Um, if you look at the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts for the UK since it was created in 2010, every single one of them has been wildly optimistic and always wrong, um, without exception. Um, they've always delivered what a chancellor wanted it to say. This is not um, an independent office in any shape or tool, nor is it about budget responsibility. It's about endorsing the figures that the chancellor wants to hear. Um, go and read something by John Kenneth Galbraith, um, The New Industrial State and the Affluent Society, where he talks all about all these things in ooh, the 1950s and 1960s, yeah. how managers feed to their bosses the bullshit that the managers want to hear. Yeah. Um, and that's what the OBR does. Um, so, look, I am quite happy to take a contrarian view because because I'm one of the 8% of economists in the world who are roughly called heterodox rather than hegemonic um, economists. So there's the mainstream, 92%, all of whom buy that philosophy 
and economics chucked out by Oxford, this mathematical model of the world where everything is all around pro markets. And the alternative is that there are some of us who will look at alternative models and look at reality and ethics and say, what's the real world? And my mate, I've referred to him already, Danny Blanchflower, he calls this the economics of walking about. And he has actually written papers about the economics of walking about. And both Danny and I rather believe in this. So we actually share the idea. You know, when we want to know what's going on, you go and ask people. I always reckon that my, the best um, economic forecaster I know is my barber. Um, Chris is brilliant. He can tell me because he talks to so many people all day, every day, um, because there aren't that many barbers in my area. Um, and Chris knows them all. Um, I live in a rural area, so he talks to the shops, he talks to the farmers, he talks to the councillors, he talks to everybody else. And he tells me what's going on, what the mood of the, of the place is. And he's brilliant in that sense. So I know what's going to happen because Chris knows what's going to happen. And that's what Danny does. In fact, if you ask ordinary people, is there going to be a recession? They are much better at predicting recessions than economists are. If you ask them, is there going to be a boom? They're much better at saying, yeah, I'm planning to spend this year than any economist is at working out whether they're going to or not. Because actually, it's called the animal spirits. And animal spirits are a term created by Lord Keynes, the greatest economist of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, who financed the First and Second World Wars for the UK government. You know, we've got a lot to thank him for, really. Yeah, freedom and a few other things besides. But he also came up with some brilliant economic theories. And he described the animal spirits that we have. Those are what drive the economy. If you go and talk to people, you find out what they think, what's going to happen. And that's what Danny and I will do a lot of. We listen, hear, synthesize and explain how we think the world's going to work on the way that people feel about things. But obviously there's theory as well. Let's not pretend there isn't. Of course there is. But that's how I come up with my ideas. Uh, formulas tend to be a bit absent in my work, if I'm totally honest. Not many sigmas, I, alphas, betas. Here's a formula that somebody has produced. Jock Gibson says there are some proposals within the SAP ranks that Scotland quotes would only have a proper economy if it had a population of 25 million, close quote. Look, that's complete nonsense. I mean, I you know, there's always this thing, who do we compare Scotland to? I've been to most Eastern European countries now, many of which are smaller. I mean, obviously Poland and Hungary are, mm. but if we talk about the Slovakias and the Czech Republic and Croatia and all those countries, and I've been to many of those, um, for work, I'm, I've never been on holiday to one of them. Um, but they're all smaller than Scotland will be. Scotland will be a mid-sized European state. It's roughly the size of Denmark. We will say, oh, you know, why compare with Denmark? Well, because it's the same broad geographic territory. Um, it's got a big sea area, just like yeah. Denmark has. It's got roughly the same population. It's got an incredibly good university system. So has Scotland. Um, it's got its own currency. Um, so should Scotland. Um, Denmark's refused to go into the euro. So should Scotland. Um, it's an incredibly good comparator. Um, is I mean, And I have worked at Copenhagen uh, Business School for ooh, since 2015 on an off. Um, so I know Copenhagen quite well. Um, is the comparison a good one? Yeah. Um, is Denmark a viable state? Yeah. Is Scotland perfectly capable of being a vi viable state? Yeah. What's the great advantage that Scotland has over Denmark? You don't have to learn Danish. Um, that's the big advantage. Um, the downside, I'm not quite sure that the Danish pastries are as good. If I'm totally honest, I've never found a patisserie in Scotland as good as those in Copenhagen. But you don't have to speak Danish. The argument would be geographical. I mean, why isn't Denmark part of Germany? Well, precisely, because it, because it's a different nation state. It's a different people with a different culture, a different history, a different background, historically. The same as the Scots are not English. No, They're not. Exactly. Well, they Richard, have. it's been educational and informative and entertaining. Thank you very much. We have to close now. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, putting aside the time to talk to us. Uh, we've tried to get through as many of the questions as we can. But you answered a whole bunch of them along the way, for which I'm terribly grateful. So uh, if you could stick around for a few minutes afterwards, please, I'll just make some concluding remarks to the, the good folks uh, watching and listening. So there we are, folks. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to all of you for, uh, for uh, watching us tonight. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the TNT show. As ever, we have a formidable list of guests lined up for future shows. Uh, as you can probably gather from this evening, this is the place for the big hitters. And if you want to know more, uh, you'll see all of the data 
on independencelive.net. Next week, the show features uh, Eva Crombie, who's a member, a solicitor, and a member of Alaba. So we'll be talking to her about uh, the Alaba view of uh, independence, dare I say, economics, and perhaps ethics as well. And as always, a reminder to look out for my column in the Sunday National every second weekend. This weekend, it'll be uh, Dr. Elliot Bomer, uh, who will no doubt be talking about the Constitution or the lack of it. And many thanks to all of you, by the way, for your kind comments about the column on social media. So to all of you, thanks for joining us. Please stay safe and take care. Oh, and one last thing, if you get a second, please go to the crowdfunder and make a contribution to keeping Indy Live independent and live. Thank you again. Good night, all. Thank you.